The following is a teaching by Thamo Naidu. Thamo provides oversight to the Gate Global family of churches and is the founder and senior elder of Gate Ministry Santon, Gauteng, South Africa. His ministry calls the church to return to accurate biblical patterns and to raise up the sons of God to represent Christ in the earth. I know we're living in calamitous times. COVID-19 has become a deadly virus. It's taken out people extremely close to us. Many people that we know of have been affected and some have not survived. They've succumbed to the virus. We are also praying for those that are infected that God will bring them through and they will have a testimony to share concerning the power of healing and so forth. I told you that la I told you last week that last year, 2020, was a year where God was preparing us, recalibrating us, reconstituting us, bringing us back to Him, restoring us, reviving us, renewing us, teaching us how to live by His Word. But um, but this year, this year, um, the year 2021 has to be a year where we come forth polished, refined, uh, wiser, more experienced, empowered, and ready for shining forth, bringing forth the, go the, the message of, of the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14 tells us that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world, to, the, to all of the inhabitants of the earth in every category, every tier um, of life, uh, in, in, a, in all the hierarchies, all the domains, and, and, and people are sectionalized and they live in so many different fields of engagement. And my prayer is that the year 2021 will be the beginning of a year where we can bring some hope and some understanding of the God we serve and how that if we serve him, we can be sustained and kept uh, in the midst of deep and difficult times. And, and if we are not sustained and kept, how we can ensure that our lives are secured eternally, that if we should sleep, if we should die, we would have a life in God and never be separated from the one whom, who, in whom we have come to love and know. So this is a season that we are entering into that is extremely important where every true believer of God will need to become a witness of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom. Not a witness of Christianity, but a witness of Christ and how people can be brought into the family of God. I will talk to that in a little while. But for us to emerge as a people, 2020 was constituting us, bringing us to understand eternal designs, divine patterns of how God assembles his people within his ecclesia, how he extracts his people, invites them into his family, and constitutes them as a new human race amongst the races of man, of humankind. And how the ecclesia, which is called the church, becomes the holy nation of God and how God arranges them metaphorically as 12 tribes and each tribe having its own identity, but the 12 coming together made up of multiple clans and those clans made up of multiple families, how when you bring them all together, the Church of Jesus Christ is constituted 
and uh, brought under the headship, the sovereign headship and leadership of Christ, our Lord and our King. But for that to happen, God is raising up in the earth uh, a spiritual man. And when I say a spiritual man, I'm using language from the scriptures, uh, language that could be found in Romans chapter 50, uh, chapter 8, I beg your pardon, Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And while I may not go through all of the scriptures today, and I don't want these teachings to come forth in the systematic way that I sometimes teach, I want to speak to us, even though I will read the scriptures and point you to certain things. But my approach is to bring us to a place where we would get to understand what God wants for us. The first thing that you need to understand is that God is raising up a people in the earth that must become witnesses to him. From, the, from now on, there will emerge a people in the earth who would bring, who would uh, bring the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of salvation, the good news of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom, meaning how in every facet of our lives, God wants to establish his sovereign domain in every facet and how this gospel of salvation would come to bring hope to people. And in a world of great chaos, of confusion, and if I may use the language in Zechariah of the rider and the horse, then the horse is blind and the rider is mad. And a blind horse uh, carrying a mad person brings confusion to the world. And confusion is the characteristic feature of the world that we live in. There, there's a blurring of truth. There is uh, interpolation of information between what is authentic and what is spurious, what is true and what is fake. And because there's so much of misinformation being communicated together with information, people do not know what to believe anymore. And I told you last week, the truth is singular. And, and the truth is embodied in a person. And that person's name is Jesus Christ. He said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man, no human can come to the Father, to the Father, God as Father, and study that. While God has many names, the nomenclature that describes uh, the, the various attributes of God, the whole category of names, um, that describes God, but one of the preeminent, primordial, the absolute centrality of that captures all names is that God is Father. No man can come to the Father but by me, but by me. It's a very isolated, individualistic, and very, very, very uh, self-centered statement to make from a humanistic point of view. For Jesus in his human being, in his human form, in his incarnate form to make that statement, he must be highlighting a very important point. What he was basically saying is that no one can come to God unless they study truth embodied in a person whom the Father called the Son. So when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, he's studying truth as in studying um, sonship. To be a son is the embodiment of the hodos, the method of approaching God. Um, I'm the way, the aletheia, the truth, which is uh, uh, which simply speaks about the, the veritable or verifiable expression or demonstrable manifestation of what is inside me. 
that the very essence of my being is manifested in how you study me. And to know truth, to know the appearance of truth, you have to study me. I will show you as a sun how truth manifests in the sun. And I am the life. In other words, I am the, the unquenchable. You cannot in any way extinguish the very existence of my being. I, I exist. And this is unending life, uninterrupted life. This is life that cannot be uh, removed by death. Uh, this is being uh, inseparable from the eternal nature of God who lives and cannot even perish, fade or die. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, he's talking about a spiritual man. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you have the time, you can read it. Uh, I, I just don't have all the time to go into it, but you can read verse 47. Uh, the first man was a natural man, but the last man was a life-giving spirit, and he's referred to also as a spiritual man. So, so we belong to a category of people who, who are called a spiritual man. A spiritual man and, and when I use the word man, I'm not using it in a gender-sensitive way. I'm using it in a universal, all-inclusive way. I'm referring to male and female. The spiritual man is a man who is governed by the Spirit and by God, the Word. The spiritual man is a man who is governed by the Spirit of God, and the Word of God. That man, the Spirit, who is governed by the Spirit and the Word, is a reference to how Christ indwells each one of us. So when I say a spiritual man, which God is raising up in this hour, in this season, in this time, please hear me. God is raising up a corporate man who has the spirit and the word. And when those two come together, we refer to that as Christ in you, the hope of glory. How God the Father and the Son dwells in us by the spirit. I'll, I'll explain these things to us. So let, let me firstly highlight that the, the spiritual man is not a ghost. He is he is not, he is not uh, docetic, doesn't come uh, in, in any other form, but in a very literal human form. A spiritual man, in an anthropological way, is a human being. So if you want to know who a spiritual man is, it's a man who lives in a human body. So that includes you, that includes me, but the spiritual man is referring firstly to the corporate body of Christ, a body thou hast prepared. You can read this, and I've read these scriptures from Hebrews chapter 10. The spiritual man is firstly a human being that is assembled and placed in the body of Christ. And so the spiritual man is a corporate man, but the corporate man is made up of individual people like you and me. This person is a completely developed person, completely developed person. One of the most powerful examples of the spiritual man is found for us in Luke, and we have to study Jesus here, in Luke chapter two, verse 52, the Bible tells us that Jesus, in, that Christ in the incarnate form, Christ incarnate, known to us as Jesus Christ, he lived a total, wholesome, absolute human life. He was very man. 
even though he, the, the Christ in him was very God, the eternal Logos in him was very God, but when he lived in the earth, he chose to, to suspend his divinity and depend upon the Holy Spirit to govern his humanity. And because he lived under the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit filled him in the womb, the Holy Spirit was always with him. Even though at the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit took very active uh, leadership over him in terms of guiding him and directing Jesus um, on how he should engage the word in representing his father in the management of the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus, anthropologically speaking, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So when we talk about the spiritual man that God is raising presently, it is a man who is a well-developed person, spiritually, socially, physically, or intellectually. Or if I may use the order of Luke 2, 22, intellectually, physically, socially, um, I mean, spiritually and socially. He grew in favor with God and men. So he grew intellectually, he grew physically, he grew spiritually, and he grew socially. The four quadrants of one's development. I want to say to us that God is not looking for extremists, he's not looking for strange, weird uh, people, he's not looking for anti-social people, he's not looking for people that, that, uh, are, uh, that are naive to how we should live our lives. In fact, he's looking for people who are well-developed, and many of us uh, can fall into the entrapment of, of just wanting to grow spiritually unto God, but not realize that our social IQ, our SQ, our social quotient, our social quotient is, um, is lacking. That we don't know how to relate to people. If we are going to change the world, we have to learn from Jesus who did not just grow unto God and was totally familiar with the environment of holiness, sacredness, that sacral dimension. But uh, Jesus was also a native in a human context, in a cultural milieu, in a social, a political, and economic environment. He understood the context of how to exist. And, you know, my message to you today is that we must develop. Uh, in this year, it will take social skills to reach people. Uh, if you can't communicate with people, engage people, know how to become all things to all men without compromising core values and principles, I think we will have problems. We also have to grow up physically, physically. The church in the world today has to grow up physically. That means that Christians need to become, um, that we need to have a, an appearance to us that is healthy, hygienic, um, that is disciplined, that can cope with uh, all the challenges of life, like the pandemic, while it's affected healthy and, 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 and unhealthy people. But I think those uh, that really suffered most were people that did not take care of their bodies the way they should have. I'm not saying that's a general case, and I do not want to be accused of gentlemanization because some very good and healthy people have also been taken out. But it's very important for us to take care of our physical appearance. And, and there's so many complex dimensions to that. And obviously, we have to also develop intellectually. One of the things that will emerge in the hour that we are living in 
if we are going to reach the world, and my, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to finish the message today. Time has gone so quickly, so quickly. But developing our cognitive abilities, educating ourselves, understanding uh, the, the information that is out there and how to discern it, separate it, uh, know the, the will of God, know the mind of God, and, and allow that to inform our understanding uh, in terms of how we make decisions dem demands that we have an intellectual, intellectual quotient also. Uh, so we need to develop ourselves intellectually. We need to have an IQ. We need to grow that IQ. We have to train ourselves. We have to study. We have to be knowledgeable. We have to be adaptable, not compromisable, but adaptable. We, we must be fit, strong, healthy. Uh, we have to take care of our bodies. We need to develop our ability to stand in the presence of God uh, in favor, but we also need to know how to engage people of all religions, of all convictions, of all philosophies, of all ways of life. We are not supposed to be reclusive. That's why Jesus was not born from the tribe of Levi, which was a reclusive, ascetic, extremist um, group of people who choose, chose to live in seclusion. Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah that produces kings uh, that engage, that relate, that socialize, that participate. And in this season, the church has to arise to a position where we can engage kings and merchants, politicians, and economists, and people of every degree of life. Jesus was familiar and comfortable with engaging little kids as much as he engaged very, very educated and powerful people. He confounded people like Pilate and so forth. He confounded the, the, the academics of his time, the lawyers, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priestly educated order. And similarly, we do it not in an esoteric way, but in a humble and very simple way. The truths we share comes with such clarity. I know I'm overemphasizing the point, but to be a spiritual man, you need to be a human being and a well-balanced, well-developed human being. That's what I'm asking for. The second thing is to be a spiritual man, you must be led by the Holy Spirit. The Romans chapter eight is a very, very powerful portion of scripture. And um, let me see if I can read it for you uh, quickly. Romans chapter eight, and we can read from uh, verse four, I think. Yeah. The, um, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to our humanity, that's the flesh, the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, in this season, God is now going to bring us to a place where we're going to be, we are going to be governed by the spirit and not by our humanistic prejudices and preferences. We must not let our humanity get in the way of being directed, led, uh, come out of, under what, what I would refer to as the hegemonic principle, the leadership principle of being submitted to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not make you behave foolishly. The Holy Spirit is a person in the Godhead. While you may not see him, but he is the most sober of, uh, uh, of, of persons in the Godhead. He would, in a sober way, educate you on how to become all things to all men, how to speak through a human language and behave in a human body in such a way that represents God on the earth. He is here to show you the Son of God 
how to live in accordance to God's word so that your father in heaven is glorified. And, and while I would talk more to these things in the days ahead, I emphasize here today that a spirit man, a spiritual man is led by the spirit of God. It says further, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. That means that if you live humanistically, then your ambitions, your visions, your, your desires will be governed by selfish interest, by survivalistic instincts, and by self-preservation. Humans protect themselves like animals do from other animals in the wild. I am saying to us today that those who live after the Spirit do not live for themselves, but live for God. Their goals, their ambitions, their aims are to be on a mission for God. They are here on a mission. They have set their hearts in an assiduous way to represent God. They are not in any way caught up with themselves. And this is what it says here. They've set their minds. Colossians 3.1 will say that you have to set your mind on eternal things. And this is what the Holy Spirit will do. I wish I had the time to go into the detail of what I want to say, but I will continue my thoughts with you on Sunday and talk about some of these things because when you start to know how to set your mind, I've been studying the book of Zechariah during this week of the fast. I studied uh, portions of scripture like, like Joshua, uh, where God told this man that was, was who had filthy garments that, smell, uh, that stunk which, with the smell of human excrements. It was a horrible smell. And he was high priest. And he was representing a people who, whose, whose presence were not well received by God. That's the, the garments. And God said to him, if you know my ways and study my commandments and do my will, I will make you stand in the most powerful of audiences both in heavenly and earthly places, if you really read the context of what God is saying, you will stand in an august, very unique company. And I want to say to you today that if you learn how to shift your focus and give, make God the highest priority of your lives, not your business, not your career, not your studies, even though all of that has a unique place in your lives, when you put God first, when you get the order right, everything else will correlate, will correlate. And so it's of importance that we set our minds on the things of the, that we do not set our minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. To think as a human is to disconnect from the eternal presence of God, from the spirit of God from the life of God. Death here is not physical, it's spiritual. Spiritual death is worse than just the body expiring. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So if you get to be a spiritual man, a corporate man, and you live your life on the earth representatively, you live it, knowing that you live for another, not for yourself. You will have life and you will have peace. And peace here means that, that every aspect of your life will be sealed with the favor and the grace of God. That's how a spiritual man lives. For it is not subject to the law uh, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, no, indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you live for yourself, live for your money, live for your assets, live for your 
very naive and narrow worldviews and you've developed an ideology that may have some strains of truth in it, but it's not the truth, I can assure you, you will not please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he is not his. So the spiritual man operates in the spirit. That does not mean he's, he's involved in astral travel, in a kind of a, kind of a uh, you know, in, uh, being involved with God outside of the human body. Um, no, no, this is not out of body experiences. Uh, this is not a, trans, a transcendental position or an incorporeal principle. Uh, no, uh, this is that you are dwelling or you've made your habitation uh, in, and created in such a way that the Holy Spirit is now leading you and he is present, believe me. He does speak. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And when the Spirit of God is on, on you, it is called the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead. In other words, your body is not alive to how the world tells you to live because of sin. It will not take you away um, into all sorts of avenues and, and passages and corridors in life, but you will start to live your life now, totally sold out to God, because the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The Holy Spirit will show you how to live according to divine order, divine standards, divine arrangements, divine character. In other words, your life will be ordered the way God determined it to be lived, and the constitution of heaven will establish itself in your life as compliancy. You would be regulated by the order of God. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. Not, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. That's your humanity. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led hegemonically, this is a very powerful word here. It's a word ago, which means to lead, to lead by laying hold of. In other words, when the Holy Spirit takes the reins of your life, when he lays hold of you, when he's attached to you, when he's married to you, when he is in absolute control of your life and his majestic presence, magisterial presence, starts to direct the order of your life, then you are functioning now as a son of God or as a spiritual man. And that's my prayer for you today, that you will start to live and grow into what God wants for us. Yes, I want to talk to us about the importance of us now becoming visible in the season uh, where the glory of God will be seen in us. I think we will see a manifestation of an element within the church that will arise to be a righteous order, not an elitist remnant in inverted commas, exclusive group, but a very, very powerful group of people who have gone through the fire, gone through multiple testings, but now we're going to arise to become a voice. You will see a fatal attraction. You will see many people coming to us. But to do that, our lives have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Remember what happened to Jesus at the River uh, Jordan when he was, after he was baptized, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, a picture of gentle descent, of a kind of a passive form of leadership. Yes, the dove is a domestic animal 
uh, a bird, a domestic creature. The bird, the dove, which speaks of peace, of favor, of grace, of prosperity, of wholesomeness. Yes, the Holy Spirit now comes to gently live in, in, in his life. And the Holy Spirit, together with the Word that was incarnate in the body of Christ, the eternal Logos, together would lead Jesus. And that's how Christ would be formed in that body of Jesus and lead him to adjudicate and administrate and steward uh, the kingdom of his Father. That's why he said, now the kingdom is at hand. And I want to say to us here today, we're moving into those days, and, but I have to first talk about how important it is to be a spiritual man, how important it is to be led by the Spirit and by the Word, and the Holy Spirit has been promised to us. Jesus said it to his 12, you're not allowed to do anything, even though you've walked with me for 42 months, for three and a half years, but you can't do anything until this, the promise has come to you. And the promise there is not things. The promise is the Holy Spirit, a person in the Godhead who would lead and govern the 12 and the 120 as a collective um, to advance the kingdom of God on the earth as the church. And I'll talk to all of these things, but I will really share with you some of the things the Lord is sharing with me about how we're going to move forward. But the preparation is to now rise up as a spiritual man. And as a spiritual man, to start functioning um, and becoming more visible in the world that we live in. So please work on your total and wholesome development. Develop your skills uh, generally, generally, there are many believers, many sons of God, well, children of God, who have not learned how to grow up into divine sonship, into divine sonship by developing things like the intellectual and social skills, the physical skills. And these quotients in our lives have to be improved. Uh, we have to break generational curses, including genetical uh, illnesses that we've inherited. And for us to do all of these things, we have to change the order now. And I can tell you it's gonna happen in the time that we're living in. My time is far spent. I've spoken more than I should with you. But please hear my heart today. And I'm sorry that I could not finish the message today. But I will continue speaking to you conversationally, speaking to you as best as I can to impart the grace of God to you. But hear me today, I am deeply excited about the year ahead. I think it's gonna be a glorious year, a victorious year, because we are moving into a place where we will see many come to the light of his glory and many prophetic scriptures will reach their, their full, fullest fulfillment. They've been fulfilled periodically, but now we're gonna see them reach the harvest, the completeness. So let me just pray with you and pray that God will help you. Father, I thank you for the privilege I have of sharing your word with your precious people. I bless your people today, Lord, as they prepare themselves for a season where they can be true witnesses in the world. And Lord, as they are making their preparation, let there be wholesome and totalic, total, total growth in their lives. May they grow unto you, unto men, in, in stature and in, in wisdom. May they grow, Lord, in every facet of their lives. Help your people to deal with impediments, with blind spots, with things that they may not even see in themselves, uh, and help them to come out of it, because this is an hour where you are raising us up after the order of the people that is conformed to the character of Judah, a, a people that, that will exhibit the amazing gospel of Christ. And we know that out of Judah, you are raising uh, your people. You're raising your people. So I bless your people today. 
And I thank you, Lord, that we could conclude the fast now and we could do so with the deep assurance that, that you are going to take us to new heights and to new places and you cause us to stand in places that we've not been to before. I am so excited for the year ahead, Father. Help us to walk now in your grace and in your favor. In Jesus' name, I pray these mercies. Amen. Amen. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of our, of our broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. I bless you. I thank you for this time. We love you dearly. And we'll continue talking with you in the week ahead. Mm-hmm.